Welcome to this Autism Ontario webinar, Let's Get Moving, Ideas to Get Off the Couch During COVID-19. Well, last week I did my first set of jumping jacks on a webinar. Um, and this time I'm not really sure what I'm in store for, but I do know that this is a topic that um, is very important to, to all of us as parents and to everyone because it has been, uh, it, it can be challenging. It can be challenging. We're going into a heat wave now in, in Ontario, and this is a very, very timely topic. And to bring us to the table today, we have Ellen Yak, occupational therapist. Um, Ellen, thanks for joining us um, on the webinar today. Thanks for inviting me. I'm really excited to share some uh, activity ideas with uh, the group today. Excellent. Well, before we get started, I got a couple housekeeping items for everyone, and then we'll Bob is to get your questions answered. We have a lot of content today, but you can use the ask question box right below me like you always do, and I will aspire to get answers to you from Ellen. If you have any problems with technology, click the help button. And from time to time, we are going to be referencing um, uh, different resources that we have for you today. I just popped them up uh, for you to have a look at. One note is some of the content, photos, and videos that we will be showing today isn't available in the uh, PowerPoint slides for privacy reasons. Okay, so with that out of the way, let's bring back Ellen and let's talk about... First off, before we even get into our objectives, Ellen, um, why are you here talking to us today? What, what is in your background that I guess makes you qualified? The reason we reached out to you and asked you to talk about getting off the couch during COVID-19. Well, as an occupational therapist, I'm involved in working with children, adolescents, adults who may have difficulty performing activities of daily living. So uh, people are confused about the term occupational therapist. They sometimes uh, think that we're involved in vocational assessment or training, but occupation really means activity, any activity someone okay. engages in. So we are professionals who look at what barriers interfere with people participating in activities to their fullest. My area of expertise is sensory and motor development, and I work with children and adults looking at uh, how to improve their ability to engage in daily activities and look at sensory and motor strategies to support that development. I'm also involved in working with children and adolescents and adults looking at self-regulation, and that's the ability to manage arousal levels and emotional levels and we look at using sensory motor tools to help those individuals manage arousal and emotion levels and I've been increasingly being uh, involved with um, clients who've been referred who have stress management issues and looking at what sensory motor tools can help with stress management and as you'll hear today I'm going to be talking about uh, some activities that can support stress management during COVID. Well, yeah, I mean, we've, we've had a couple presentations. It's hard to talk about anything without the, the context of COVID, but stress levels are up across the board, and it is something that we, we are all facing, parents and caregivers on, on the call as well. So our objectives today, we're going to discuss the importance of, of movement activities. We're going to suggest some movement accommodations uh, when seated for online education. Um, and online everything, as a lot of us are, uh, are dealing with. Um, we're going to provide uh, some uh, activities for a range of agents in versus outdoor, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, some equipment recommendations for everyone's budget. Um, so I'm going to hand over the controls to you now, um, uh, Ellen, but like, why let's get moving? I mean, it seems evident to all of us, but let's start here. Why is this? Why is this important? Well, when Ola first contacted me, she was saying, what activities can we do as a family to have fun? So I'm going to talk about activities that um, hopefully will be fun for families. I'm also going to give a little bit of information about stress management and talk a little bit about stress and as it relates to our ability to, as I said earlier, regulate our arousal levels. That's our level of alertness and regulate our emotions. And the other reason for young children why it's important to keep moving is you want to prevent motor delay or, or, or regret motor regression. So for young children 
who have to be inside for a lot of time and they're not exposed to a lot of motor activities that they'd be getting at school and in gym and in extracurricular classes. You want to just think about keeping them moving to prevent any kind of delay. So just to um, move quickly to the stress slide so we can get to some of my pictures. This presentation really is going to be a show and tell and talk a lot about activities, but I did want you to understand the stress response. Um, I, did you move me? Or do we, we have the stress response slide? I did, sir. I thought you were, I thought you were oh. asking me, so I jumped in. Okay. I jumped in. So, <laughs> no? No? So for all of us, um, the stress response leads to the natural fight or flight response. And any stress, and it's a primitive response, it's when we need an extra burst of energy to defend against predators. That's how we were wired. That stress would lead to that burst of energy to let us to flee, to flee from the, the predators or to fight the predators. So that's a fight flight response. But anything that in, um, creates stress, the body is set up to have that flight or fight response. So what happens in the body with stress, your respiratory rate increases, your heart rate uh, increases, your intestinal muscles relax, um, muscle uh, blood is pumped from the gut to your limbs, and it gets ready the body ready to fight or flee. So um, during these times of COVID, I would suggest that many of us are in a heightened state of stress. Um, and it might not be the, the obvious things in terms of uh, loss of income, um, trying to manage children's education at home while you're working at home and worrying about childcare, let alone just worrying about health, health issues. Those are some of the obvious ones. But just the fact that we're living with so much uncertainty and unpredictability and lack of control of our lives. So we might think we're, we're managing okay, but underneath there's that low level of stress just about uncertainty. So when people's lives are unpredictable, it creates stress. And because stress leads the body to be in a state of readiness to, to act, if we don't have that opportunity to move, okay, it can lead to heightened arousal, uh, high levels of frustration, high levels of anger, difficulty managing ang anger, because your body is wired now to have some kind of act. So, for example, uh, when parents talk about children becoming aggressive or explosive behavior, often they'll say they went from zero to 100. But when people are living under stress, they're starting off at 80, okay, because their nervous systems are being wired, right, to fight or flee. So if any little thing triggers a behavior, they go right to explosion because they're already up at 80. So that's um, why it's so important to look at how we can provide motor activities because sensory motor activities helps reduce that stress response. Can I ask you, you said something sure. in there that I found very interesting, and that was that a lot of people think they're managing quite well. Is it common within sort of the mental health community or in the in the medical community right now is that you're talking to people, they think they're doing well, and they just don't even realize that they've got that anxiety or that stress level has moved up? Mm-hmm. And what people are commenting on is that they think they're doing well, but little things that they used to be able to cope with in terms of what comes up day to day, they're having difficulty coping with. So for those of you right. out there who are arguing with their spouses more, right, or cry because you broke a plate and you never really cry because you broke a plate, you're also living up there, you know, at 80. So you're coping, but you don't understand or appreciate the amount of stresses on your nervous system. And you might be fatiguing more. You might be sleeping more, which, again, just starts to, to escalate. Um, so with COVID, COVID is sort of, um, and living with COVID, COVID um, is really escalating stress because of that um, unpredictability. Um, and again, I'm not spending a lot of time in, the, in, in this presentation quoting quoting studies, but there's been lots of studies how in, unpredictability in situations, lack of control really uh, significantly increases stress. Um, and 
arousal regulation and emotion regulation can be supported by sensory motor tools. And there's lots of research that supports that in terms of motor tools uh, supporting anxiety management and anger management. And I'm only going to be talking about those motor tools, but I just wanted to let you know for children, you also have access to some behavioral cognitive programs. Uh, the how does your engine run in the zones of regulation are, are quite useful to, to help with that as well as a five point incredible scale. I just wanted to talk about about those, but those I'm not dealing with. No, I'm really. Go those ahead. are in the yep. handouts. Those are in our handouts, right? Um, we've offered those. I have a reference for the zones of regulation. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. And um, no, we. I just have this picture of the brain the red circle is around the limbic system and that's a part of the brain that's involved in emotion and memory and the blue part of the brain is the prefrontal cortex and the cortex and research has shown when the limbic system is activated when you're in a fight or flight response and you're fearful uh your uh, limbic system becomes really really active and it decreases your access to your uh, thinking part of the brain where executive functions occur. That's your prefrontal cortex and your cortex. So when you're in that stress response, when you're in fight flight, you don't always make the best decisions. You don't always use the best language. So think about you in a fight with your spouse and you're really, really angry and you prepared all these logical um, arguments before you enter the, the argument. But in the middle of the argument, you know you're getting angrier and angrier. You forget all your logical um, preparation and you leave and you go, darn, I wish I, I forgot to use that, that uh, reason. Or you're when you're working with your children and you're angry and you're getting really, really frustrated and during times of COVID, you're not using your nice uh, low volume. You're not using all the strategies that all the parenting books have talked about, okay? And that's because when you yourself are in that heightened state of arousal, you can't access good language. You can't access your um, uh, prefrontal cortex and your cortex to, to be able to uh, remember some of the strategies you've been trained. And motor input, gross motor input, helps to decrease that activity of the limbic system. Okay, so the limbic system can be buzzing throughout the day um, because of stress. And if you input activity, gross motor activity, and there's other activities, but today we're talking about gross motor. But when you implement those gross motor activities throughout the day proactively, you can help reduce that activity of the that limbic system. And that's why, you know, an adult goes to a, a doctor and says they're under stress and they're really, really anxious. One of the first things people talk about is getting exercise. One of the, you know, people who exercise regularly, when they don't have access to exercise, they note that they're not um, um, as, as able to cope with the demands of work and home. A lot of parents will say, um, you know, after dinner, before the child goes to bed, they like to go out and have a run or, or, or walk around the block because they know they're settled more. Teachers will tell you, you when you have multiple rainy days and you have lots of indoor recesses, the kids are climbing the walls. And there's lots of yeah. studies to show that motor input um, can help with um, reduction of limbic system activity. Interesting. So occupational therapists in like 1984 started using the term a sensory diet. Occupational therapist Patricia Wilbarger used this term. And they use this term to describe a, a prescribed combination of activities and environmental accommodations designed to meet an individual's sensory behavior and emotional needs. So that term was seen in the literature a lot. Um, and at that point, um, there wasn't as much buy-in to the thought about how we implement sensory motor activities throughout the day to manage um, our stress, to manage our arousal levels, to support children and behaviorally. Um, 
they were starting to, to uh, from 1984 to, to um, the late 90s, there was an increasing recognition about the importance of this, an increased recognition also just in public media. This is a cartoon taking, taken from um, a newspaper, you know, that, you know, allow time to, to spin, you know, that, that parents certainly knew and teachers certainly knew that it was important for kids to have an opportunity to move and how it affected their behavior. But it wasn't um, present in the, in the literature as much. And then so now, that's now is common. Pardon? Sorry, I was going to say that is now a commonly recognized fact, right? Scientific yeah. fact, and that's being yeah. that's everywhere across the board. That yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so there's really increased recognition of the importance of movement for general mental health, for stress management, behaviors, and learning. And now we don't so much talk about a sensory diet, but we talk about a sensory motor lifestyle. And over the years, particularly um, in the literature uh, looking at children with ASD, um, there's increasing amount of, of literature that looks at the importance of implementing motor activities um, for children and adults. So when I started, okay, before, I'm old. Before, <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, before you get in get into this, I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in, and I'm sure that this question is uh, you're gonna get to it, but nonetheless, it came in the moment we opened up. This was the first question that came in. I wanted to give you a second to get moving before I asked sure. you it. Um, so tell me if we're gonna deal with it later. But the question is very specific, and it's uh, from a parent. I have a 14 year old who seems sluggish and needs a lot of encouragement and direction. And he's really pushing back when I suggest that he gets moving. He has not been interested in sports and currently COVID and everything doesn't have friends that he can rely on to get, to get him moving. Um, do you got suggestions or strategies for this parent? Well, I'm going to give some suggestions for teenagers um, in okay. terms of, if, so I'm, in terms of my presentation, I pre prepared activities for different um, groups, but especially for adolescents, you want to look at what's motivating for that individual, right? Um, right. And you need to then, to, for them to participate in the choice of how they're going to get moving. And sometimes you want to go in through the back door, that it's not about you have to get off the couch and you have to get moving if they have a special interest, if they're interested in the environment, if they're interested in um, um, building things, you know, so it's, you, you can put equipment in another space part of the house where they have to go and, you know, say if they're interested in robotics, right? right. Um, don't have all the materials readily available at a desk, place them in another part of the house. So when they're doing their robotics, they have to get up off the couch and they hope to have to get it. So it doesn't necessarily have to be an activity. <clears throat> it can look at what do they enjoy engaging in and how do you implement movement within that activity? I mean, I'm dealing with the same thing. My 12 year old's really into music and, um, you know, Spotify and researching music and he's constantly in there. I mean, he spends time songwriting and stuff and he'll get up, but you know, on the weekend when I'm suggesting, you know, let's go to the park and do whatever our, our activities, him and mine were around, we would go see plays or we would go and do different things. We weren't necessarily father and son throwing the ball in the backyard. Yeah. And yeah. what I'm trying to do now is I'm like, you know, you know, grab the Frisbee, grab this, grab that, because he's not, it's not part of his general interests. Um, but I've, I've done what you said. I've said, you know what? We can't sit here on the couch all day. Like, we got to go out. Mm -hmm. you know, it's hot out, mm -hmm. I know. We'll go for a bit, bring a bunch of stuff and try mm -hmm. and get it going. But um, mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. to hear uh, mm -hmm. so what it is mm -hmm. that, uh, that comes mm -hmm. up. So, again, right, taking that, that – okay, taking that interest in music, so um, – You'd probably hate me for it, but but um, I'd look at, at how you can introduce drumming so he's moving with that. But even in terms of music in a room and if they're looking at different sites, looking at how you can post the music he likes on the wall, um, if he's doing some writing of music, having him stand up and do it. There's going to be a rocker board and a bozo ball I'm going to show you because you're right, not all kids are 
want to engage in movement. They might not be sports oriented. They might have lots of really great other interests. Um, and because of COVID, they're allowed to, you know, they have all the time to engage in them. So they're sitting at their desks. Um, you know, I can do a whole other five hour lecture on, on screen time um, because right. being on screens, particularly, you know, even for younger children, the most innocent educational program where say you're matching colors or numbers on a screen, lights go off, sounds go off, a clown, you know, goes across the, the screen. Those are all our unpredictable sensory input. And again, this isn't a, a sensory uh, webinar, but uh, unpredictable sensory input alerts a nervous system. Right. So there's okay. continual alerting of the nervous system. And when the nervous system and again, that's alerting of the limbic system. And remember what happens when the limbic system gets over aroused. Right. So that's why some children are prone to becoming really dysregulated after a period of time on, on screens, even though it's not, you know, a violent you know, video game. It can be just an innocent um, educational game, but sitting for a long time when your nervous system is getting really, really alerted, again, it can lead to explosive behavior. Mm -hmm. So that's something to consider to allow some movement. And I have some options uh, as we move on um, about what to do if a child's okay. sitting and, and on screens. <coughs> um, <coughs> So you've got my, the slide up. This slide is in Google offices. Um, so when, when OTs in the 1980s started to suggest um, implement movement activities throughout the day at school settings and work settings, uh, we really weren't um, well supported on those recommendations. And as I said, there has been an evolution. So there's a um, slide in the Google office. There are swings um, in the Google office. And you'll see the swings aren't just to relax. This gentleman is working on the swing with, with a computer. So there's increased recognition that movement um, supports attending behaviors, supports cognitive processing. So it's not unusual now to see treadmill desks. And there's been studies, there was a study um, in Barrie uh, at a high school where high school students were on, on treadmills for 20 minutes and their performance on testing improved. There was a test in Manitoba with uh, students with fetal alcohol, syn uh, fetal alcohol syndrome disorder. Um, and again, showed improvement in terms of academic performance. John Ratty is a psychiatrist at Harvard University. He wrote a book called The Revolutionary New Science of Exercise. I have it in your reference list. And he uh, has this quote, exercise is like taking a little bit of Prozac and Alderol. And if you're interested in his book, he talks about all the research available uh, about the importance of, of movement um, on mental health. Um, and um, there's lots of effects of exercise on stress and aggression, um, and I'm not going to go over them, but there's, there's significant impact on um, different chemicals that support um, self-regulation in the nervous system and help to reduce stress and help to reduce the anxiety response. And for um, some children who you have at home who are in a constant over aroused state, hyper aroused state, um, the exercise really does decrease um, arousal levels. And for those of you who have children or work with adults who engage in some um, self injurious behavior, there's been research that shows that gross motor activity helps reduce self injurious behavior. So now on to my um, show and tell part of my presentation. I, I included some of these supports that can be used, whether it's to be used during online learning that children and adults are engaged in or to be used when they're on screen just for pleasure and leisure time um, that can provide increased movement. So these are some um, move and sit cushions. So when you're sitting on the cushions, you get a little bit more movement input. Here are some examples. This is a great um, piece of equipment. It's available at Amazon. So it's an under the, the, the desk. The problem with it in a school setting, it's not portable. So this is really more useful at home, which the children can um, 
swing their legs on. And again, it's very appropriate for adults. So again, during COVID for everyone, when you're sitting at a desk for a long period of time, you're not walking to the cooler, you're not walking into your colleague's office, you tend to be at your desk more. This is a really useful piece of equipment. This is another piece of equipment where you can do more of a, a figure eight with it. Ball chairs have been used for a long time and, you know, again, in the 80s and 90s when I recommended ball chairs, people looked like I was crazy, but they're really co commonly used now. People start off using them because Pilates instructors tell them it helps with core strength and then they report that they right. like using it because it, uh, it helps with their ability to attend to task. Um, so they are being used increasingly in classrooms um, for children. There was a study done out east where kids bouncing on a chairs, uh, grade five students bouncing on chairs. Again, it helped attention to task. I don't like the idea that all children in a classroom go on a ball chair because not all children need to be on a ball chair to attend. And it can be disruptive and interfere with attending for some children. There also were two studies in a grade five classroom in Toronto um, and again, I think this is wrong, but all children were put on, on ball chairs. And one of the classrooms had to stop the, the um, study because the teacher herself was getting dizzy and nauseous watching all the children bouncing on the chairs. Um, so you really have to look at individual situations, right? So for, you know, for me, I, I get dizzy very easily and have movement issues. So for me, I could not bounce on a chair and do my work, whereas others report it's, it's really, really fabulous. For some young children, I don't recommend the ball. Sometimes um, they can get too silly. Um, so it really has to yeah, be pres prescribed individually. You have to be detective, right? You have to explore these strategies and see if they work or don't work. I've really liked these hockey stools because you can't get silly with them the way you can with ball chairs. Um, unfortunately, they're quite expensive. I think the first one starts at um, $100. Uh, there's some cheaper brands. Um, in the reference list, I have some suppliers, FDMT, um, their catalog. Uh, they have cheaper uh, stools. They're not called hockey stools, but it's a similar thing. So the bottom is, is, is curved, so when you're sitting on it, you can – rock on it and get a lot of movement but you're not getting the bouncing that for some people can be too alerting and again these be, these are these are being used increasingly in classrooms um can I, and there last question sure yep yeah. so go ahead you know we've talked about we're talking about the importance of an increase in general movement and clearly a lot of a lot of um, science has gone into the idea that this works and I think we can all attest to it personally when we do get to work out and, and do the like. But these feel more a little bit like, you know, the fidget um, fidget activities a little bit, too, where they're sitting and they're and they're moving around while they're doing other things. Um, are you suggesting or is there a suggestion that some of these help? Um, I know it's not what we're talking about today, but help with focusing on tasks as well so that they're. You know, if you want to sit them down to do that schoolwork at home, which has got, I think, one more week left or whatever it might be, that these are a good idea to bring in for that kid who, who likes to move around a lot, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. You know, fidget spinners gave fidget toys a bad rap, but... Uh, yeah. Small movements of the fingers can increase attention to tasks. That, that, there's been studies on that. Um, so at executive meetings, sometimes they put paper clips around. Does anybody play with a paper clip when they're they're listening to something? Or sometimes I've been at, at uh, conferences where I'm speaking and they leave paper clips for the speakers to, to fidget with. So. Um, Again, it's, it's very individualized, right? So for um, the fidget, fidget spinners weren't good because it deflected attention from the task because you were looking at what was spinning, right? The best fidget toy is something like I'm holding. I'm holding a string, okay? It doesn't make noise. I don't have to look at it. I can do something with my hands, okay, as I'm getting excited. I'm not anxious, but even positive energy, positive energy increases arousal, increases and in, sometimes increases the need to move. That's why some kids who are flapping, right, or jumping up and down, yeah. that's because they're excited, okay? So, yeah. um, it's natural, you know, think back at Jurassic Park when the, the Blue Jays, the Blue Jays, the Raptors 
won the NBA title. They were jumping and flapping because with really, really extreme emotion, if you win a million dollars, you're jumping and flapping. So with heightened emotions, whether it's positive or negative, your body wants to, to move. And I'm sort of simplifying it because that what it, I wasn't asked to talk about that 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 um, whole topic, but I, I I said I would put in some of these these accommodations for for movement. But again, the fidget, you know, use of the fidget, uh, use of movement. But again, it really is prescriptive because not all people need to have that kind of of, of movement to stay focused. Everybody's nervous system right. will seek out the t- amount of movement they need um, to engage in activity. Or you'll, you'll uh, again, um, I'm not suggesting everybody needs to get an, an assessment with an occupational therapist, but what I'm suggesting is don't assume that everybody needs to be sitting on a hockey stool to attend. Okay? Don't assume right. that um, everybody needs a weighted blanket. We're not talking about those kinds of accommodations today, but weighted, you know, again, when I recommended a weighted blanket 40 years ago, you know, people thought it was, you know, it was crazy. Now, weighted blankets are sold at Costco and the shopping channel, but not all people yeah. are calmed by a weighted blanket. Some people don't like to feel that weight on them. It makes them feel claustrophobic and it can create the opposite reaction. So you're always having to play um, detective. Um, when you're looking at these uh, sensory motor tools to support um, attending behaviors. One thing I want you all to try now, um, while you're just sitting there, if you're sitting, is try, uh, I'm not going to make anybody do jumping jacks today, but I want you to try and do a chair push-up because it's not, you don't need, even need equipment, but just push down on your hands and lift your bottom off your chair. Okay, and put it back down. Lift your bottom off the chair, sit back down. Lift your bottom off the chair. So even without any kind of equipment, without leaving the room, without causing disruption, you know, you can do 10 push-ups and it really gives you nice motor input. And one of the things it gives you is resistance. And we know resistance work, so pulling, pushing, lifting, carrying, um, is like giving yourself a massage. Any pressure to the skin, muscle, joints, and tendons releases chemicals to the brain that are calming. It's like when um, John Ratty talked about um, exercises, a little bit of like Prozac or Adderall. Resistance work. People um, who have a lot of anxiety report. I haven't seen studies on it yet. Um, anecdotally, people are talking about CrossFit as being one of the best activities for stress management because there's a lot of crashing. There's a lot of pressure on your joints. So doing something as simple as uh, chair push-ups, you're putting a lot of pressure on your upper extremities, right? A lot of resistance to lift your bum up, a lot of pressure on your feet as you stabilize to lift your bum up. So that's a nice um, movement activity you can do when you're just um, sitting. Some other pieces of equipment, this is a foot pedal uh, for people who have really, really restless feet. Uh, quite expensive to purchase, but you can make it with just a um, um, filled hot water bottles. Um, one of the uh, tools that I really like is TheraBand tried around the legs of the chair. So um, you can purchase TheraBand at Shoppers Home Healthcare uh, centers and you wrap the TheraBand around the legs and you can rest the feet on it and the children can bounce their feet. And again, when they're um, working, their trunks are stabilized because they're not bouncing or moving too much, just their feet are moving. You can also, if you look on um, Amazon for uh, TheraBand sitting support, you'll see it, you can buy it there, and it's, it's, it's um, again, more expensive than just buying a piece of um, TheraBand tubing. The child who's standing on a blue dome, that's called a Bozy ball. And the other two children are, are, are standing on rocker boards. So again, when your children are required to do some um, learning, you can inc- introduce bozo boost ball standing or standing on a rocker board. So again, for you, Matt, whose son, you know, really is not um, into sports um, and is not motivated by going out for a bike ride, um, even with his great dad, but he's really listening to Spotify. He doesn't want to dance, um, mm. but to give him to get a little bit of, of physical um, activity, he could stand on a rocker board. He could stand up on a ball as a ball. Okay, he can stand on a twist board. Okay, so that's an easy way. And again, um, 
treadmills. Um, when someone is, is you know, if, if you're on a screen for a long period of time um, and maybe you can negotiate, you know, because a lot of families are negotiating screen time now. Um, so you can yeah. negotiate a longer period of screen time if they're watching the screen while they're on the treadmill. Right. So that's particularly useful for, for adolescents. So now I'm going into um, not accommodations and movement to support learning or attention, but just some different activities. And I'm going to start, I'm going to review some really expensive items and I'm going to review some, some inexpensive items. Um, OTs love swings. Swings provide full body movement. So we're always looking at swings. There's a company in Toronto called Limmy Kids. And if people are looking to uh, purchase and are considering purchasing outdoor equipment and you've got outdoor space for, for outdoor equipment, I strongly recommend purchasing indoor equipment um, because okay. you get more bang for your buck because it's it's 12 months a year. Oh, someone's supposed to take this out of my room. Um, it'll only ring tw tw two more times. Um, so no Limmy Kids is an agency, uh, is a company that provides um, uh, indoor swing supports and you don't have to do anything in the ceiling it's it's flush with the ceiling uh, you can't have a drop ceiling but I've had people who live in apartments who put it in the corner of a room so they can they they have all sorts of sizes of, of how to put put it in, in a room there's all sorts of ways uh, my clients have put swings in their homes to provide input and again for children and adults uh, and adolescents with autism there's so many roles that a swing can have for very young children the 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 movement supports um communication and again that's not the topic today but swings provide a ton of gross motor fun it provides a lot of of um, encouragement of balance skills um there's so many different things you can do with a swing um, there's swings that can be just supported in a door frame. So if you don't have a lot of space and you can't put a hook in a ceiling, there's swing supports. And I'm, I've got suppliers listed um, that you can put swings uh, in, in a door frame. This um, is a great swing, again, for older children who want to do work on uh, um, arm strength. Tire swings. If you go to a tire company, they... Um, can uh, often will give you um, the inner tube for large tires. Tire swings, again, I love them inside, but a lot of families like to hire uh, hang tire swings um, from um, a tree if they have a tree in the backyard. There are swinging chairs available. Uh, this is, um, a, you're going to see a video shortly of a little uh, baby in a swing, and this was a swing from uh, Ikea, and they just took the padding okay, out in the Katie. middle. So this is a little um, Ready? Um, one year old in yeah. a swing. And as you can see, when it opens up a little bit, Video. it's placed in a small Perfect. area at the top of the stairs. Um, yeah. So you don't need that big of a space. It was put, uh, put in the hall. This is a swing that was put in the middle of a room. Um, the next swing um, is from fabric from a company called Lace and Fabric. And again, you have a list on your suppliers and they just sort of hung it um, in their backyard. So it's providing movement. I also like it again, it's providing deep pressure input. Um, but here's this swing. Okay. And they hung it or you can have two people hold it again if you're inside, you can just swing it. Um, this is a, a, a great swing and it's available at Costco now. Um, and I think it was $49. Um, there's a lot of fun that you can have with that swing and a lot of movement and kids rolling it around. And again, a lot of body movement, a lot of imaginative play because it's like a spaceship. You can pretend you're on a spaceship game. And as you can see, you can be in different positions. And it's great, again, for younger children, having your body in multiple positions, having your head in multiple positions gives you the big, biggest bang for your buck in terms of movement. This is a, a chair hammock swing. Um, you can, it's available through some of the therapy supply companies that I've listed, but in the last few years, I've gotten it at Canadian Tire. Um, and again, I have a lot of families who hang it um, 
uh, at their homes and it can be hung in a doorway. And again, it's multi-purpose because it can provide a lot of movement. So, you know, um, children swinging and bounce and, and throwing and catching a ball when they're in it. Again, um, for children who aren't motivated to engage in some motor activities, they might be more motivated while they're swinging. So I have kids playing catch with it, batting at, at balloons. But the hammock swing for those kids who need, and those adults who need calming before bedtime, I have a lot of adults who have post-traumatic stress disorder. And um, actually in our, our, our clinic, um, we have a psychotherapist and our psychotherapist and the client both sit in this hammock chair during therapy sessions. Um, and okay. it's or, very or calming, but um, I have clients with anxiety. Yep. yep. Sorry to interrupt. Yep. Before you move on here, you, we've yep. been talking about swings here with Google. Now we've gone across the board and I know you said that, you know, that's a whole other presentation. And you, and I think that for a non-educated occupational therapist or a member of the medical community, I was picking up tidbits, but is it, is it like to, just to bring it back down to my level, is it that it's also, it's fun and it gives movement? Is it the range of movement? This seems like if we're going to purchase okay. one piece so of So for this presentation, this yeah, yeah, to me, so, um, Again, my focus is on gross motor activity and swinging and fun, okay? And as I said, you can use this to do um, activities for children who sort of resist motor activities. But I, I can't help but not mention how important swings are um, for calming input. Um, any kind of repetitive rhythmic movement is calming to the nervous system, okay? So again, calms that limbic system, okay? Um, so what I like about swings is that it gives you gross motor activities. It gives you lots of play and fun. It's motivating and for most, not for all, because if you have a child who's sensitive to movement, right, who doesn't like the displacement of their sensitive center of gravity, who are fearful of having their feet off the floor, there's a term called gravitational insecurity or movement aversion, then a swing is not for them. A swing is not going to get them more motivated to, to play catch if they're so anxious while they're being on a swing. So it really has to be individualized. Um, but repetitive, rhythmic, um, slow movement is calming to the nervous system. So swings can be used for both purposes. And, and that, this hammock swing is particularly useful for both purposes. Okay? Perfect. Um, this is called a ghost. Um, this is available through different therapy supply companies that I listed in laceandfabric.com. And it just allows a lot of fun, unstructured movement, whole body movement, along with some of that resistance. So again, for the people who don't want to engage in movement activities, um, more structured movement activities, this might be fun for them because um, they're in there and they're pushing and they look funny and they can take pictures. Um, this is a, a saucer. So for, for people who um, don't have the space or are concerned about hanging a swing, um, these saucers really provide a lot of fun movement, a lot of, um, uh, they're through FDMT, um, but uh, are more expensive than this. This is a Billy Bow. This is available on Amazon. It's $39. Um, and if you Google YouTube Billy Bow, I didn't have time today to show you the video, but they have lots, of, they have a really good video of all the different ways you can use a Billy Bow. Um, it's small, so it's easily stored. They can stack if you have more. And again, it allows a lot of rocking for kids. And you, I've had set six and seven and eight year olds in them. Um, and you can rock back and forth in them and you can spin. And again, if you're having trouble introducing movement activities, um, if they're watching television, they can have, you know, have television time if they're on the, the rock, or, uh, if they're in their billy bow. So that's one way of introducing um, movement when there's resistance. Ikea has this fun um, chair. It's called the egg chair and it allows for some spinning. Um, if you're looking what's better in terms of gross motor, if you were choosing one or the other, I would choose the billy bow because you get spinning and you get rocking um, with the billy bow. 
again, for children who aren't that motivated to move, um, filling up a rubber pool and stuffing it with balls and hiding things in there. Um, so they have to search and move to get in there. They can stand on a chair and jump into it. So that's another way of um, getting those kids who don't like structured um, movement activities. I also like creating um, areas in a basement with um, mattresses. Um, you can get old mattresses. Um, these are for the kids who, you know, are jumping on the couches, um, but you want to provide them with a little bit more space to jump. You can use old mattresses. Um, and uh, in this uh, picture, I got a um, a duvet cover from a discount store. I went to an upholsterer, tell them what you want it for. They give you uh, pieces of foam and you stuff um, the foam into um, the duvet cover. And it's a really nice crashing pad. So again, we're not just looking at riding bikes, playing with a Frisbee, thrown balls. Right. So I'm not talking a lot about that today because those are traditional activities people already know about. I'm looking at ways of different ways of getting your kids to move. So creating a little crash corner in a corner of a, of a room is good. Um, and I've got uh, just to sh uh, uh, showing you some um, uh, this little boy on a treadmill. But instead of the large treadmill that takes a lot of space, there are uh, smaller um, tools that can be used to again increase movement and again some kids are reluctant to go outside um, some kids can't ride a bike this is a stepping machine so this is really good for teenagers and again for kids who are really resistant to doing any kind of work pair it with screen time okay so that you can do right. you know you can watch this act watch this show while you're doing some stepping it doesn't take up a lot of room again available at amazon and i think it's about 89 dollars um this is a, a mini pe peddler again available at amazon um weighted balls um our way to add some resistance work um, and it might just be so when you're when we're walking uh, again for someone um, who is doing a, an activity they're really really interested in it they want to do it all day um, you're agreeing to let them do it longer if they carry the weighted ball to the area where you have the robotics material there um, that can increase um, some movement um, I have this in um, Although it's not full gross motor activity that I was asked to talk about, um, sometimes for some individuals, just to get their hands moving might be a start, and it's just a grip strengthener. Uh, a tool that I really like uh, for teenagers is a can crusher. I think they're 15 to $25 at hardware stores, and you put the can in, you hold the top, and you press down, and that's a lot of resistance work. Um, for those kids who aren't interested in weight training, aren't motivated by this, I've had a lot of luck with this because it's something concrete and they visually see the can being crushed. Um, and with some teenagers, I've integrated it into uh, a recycling program. We've done it in some schools. We've done it in some homes. So they collect cans and they crush cans and they carry um, um, newspapers. These are some other tools that... Um, uh, I'm a, um, a home shopping network themed and I'm always looking for things. This is a body blade um, that I've had found motivating for some adolescents. And this is a body shaper. Um, both are available through um, home shopping network. Um, and this is a kettlebell. Um, and some adolescents who are, are really are interested, who might be interested in body build, building, it's a little bit easier to control than free weights. And because it's midline, you pick up the ball, the kettlebell midline, any kind of midline activities are more um, calming and, and, and organizing. So those are a review of some um, individual activities that you might not have been aware of. And um, I'm going to review some uh, family fun activities that you can do with, with other people. And I'm going to talk about indoor activities. Um, I have a list of, of household chores to do. I'm not going to review them, but they provide a lot of movement. Um, and um, I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to show you some scooter board activities and obstacle course uh, activities. Um, one of the indoor activities I like to do um, 
is um, involving stairs, whether you're in an apartment or in you're in a house. Um, for people living in apartments or condos, I talk about, you know, just using the stairs, get off one floor earlier, um, uh, climb up a couple sta stairs. That might not be that fun or motivating, but what I do in homes or in condos or apartments is I play some kind of um, game and again looking at what the child's interested in so if they like puzzles if they like stacking games or matching games so i'll put the puzzle board on the landing of the stairs and all the puzzle pieces on the bottom so they have to walk down the stairs to pick up a piece and bring it back up okay and you can do that with with any active uh, with um any kind of activity that there's pieces involved or even a sticker activity that they go down and get the sticker and walk up and put it on on the page um, I've done some sock and grocery relay or delivery. So um, this is for when you're in a home and you've got stairs. So if the laundry's in the basement, they bring up socks and put them away upstairs um, in a drawer and go back down and pick up another sock. So the, the movement is embedded in the activity. Um, and we, you can do the same thing um, with um, groceries and, and stacking cans. Um, and uh, there's lots of, uh, I, I gave you some resources, some links to um, um, different sites that have all sorts of family fun fitness, family Zumba time, family hip hop. So there's lots of sites that you can do those kinds of activities. So I've got the chores, I'm not gonna go through them. I'm gonna show you a uh, scooter board and scooter board activities are really nice, fun, gross motor activity. And again, a nice activity for those kids who aren't, uh, don't really like traditional um, sports activities. Here you see um, how you can do wall push-ups on a scooter board. You can also do scooter board hockey. You can go do scooter board picking up letters or puzzle pieces, or again, using anything that the child's interested in. You can do the scooter activities while they're sitting and pushing with their feet. Um, this is a rebounder. Um, it's a mini trampoline and many people use them in their homes. These are bigger ones. Um, and again, um, if you're looking at investing in a, in a trampoline, um, one that can be used inside um, to me is preferable. And you can again, put those um, old uh, bed mattresses underneath the um, trampoline. Um, Rolling is one of my most favorite um, activities. Again, it's full body movement. And again, um, it doesn't require a, a lot of skill. So here you've got uh, the rolling integrated with bowling. So the child rolls down the mat and knocks over the, the, the bowling pins. Um, some children just love rolling and unrolling. Uh, you can roll them up in a blanket and unroll them quickly. So for kids who seek a lot of movement, rolling is a really, really nice um, activity to do. Rolling, again, I, I'm trying to focus on a lot of indoor activities, but rolling down hills is a fabulous, fabulous activity. Um, Another thing I want you to consider, again, outdoors or indoors, the weather's nicer now. You can do um, different hopscotches outside, but you can also set them up inside. Um, but not necessarily doing, you know, the traditional hopscotch. And again, for your kids who are interested in letters or numbers, you can um, have them um, jumping on, on different numbers. And again, the jumping is great. Um, here's um, a little obstacle course. Um, that um, someone's created and you see there's a big dice so they roll the dice when you land on one spot you might have to jump and you roll the dice and it tells you how many uh, times you have to jump and when you land you know you land on different things so you create your own sort of game and again for kids who are very creative um, for kids who like a lot of structure, um, they, they can enjoy um, doing this game and building this game. So they roll the dice, you land on the red square. What does a red square tell you to do? Okay, so it's not a whole um, um, game, uh, that a traditional game that they, they've uh, been avoiding. And here's a really lovely clip of a family who really went to town in um, creating an obstacle course in their home. That is, that is impressive. That is. Alright, that's fine. I need scratch. 
And again, this is a really lovely family activity to do with siblings uh, in terms of the creativity of how you can use your space, what toys you have available. So he climbed up on uh, on the, the bunk beds. He had one of those balls where you can hold the handle and jumping. He's got one of those swings hanging in the door frame. So I like this to show you how that swing can be held and uh, seen in the door frame. He does his swinging. And I can see he's got a little bit of weak upper extremity, so I'm happy that it's also working uh, on muscle. He has to pick up a bean bag and place it um, in a, a spot. He's having to jump on those lily pads. He's picking things up. He's crawling through a tunnel. On top of the troll. You know, so for families with girl. kids who don't like to move, you can buy those tunnels. Um, hey, Ikea friends. sometimes has, has those tunnels. And maybe the tunnel is going into the kitchen. So every time the child goes into the kitchen, encourage them to crawl through the tunnel. Okay. Um, dad's there. He's a, 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 at a post and, and he stops and gives dad a, a, a hug. Um, he continues to do activities, but I'm going to, uh, he goes downstairs to the kitchen and he does a, a, a path and walks along a, a, a balance beam. So they've yet used um, some um, activities in their home. Uh, you'll, I just want to show you how he jumped on those and then just crawling under a chair. Having a simple obstacle course where children crawl under chairs or step over chairs and under um, is a really great obstacle course and again is a way to get some kids off the couch when they're really, really not into um, traditional motor activities. So I have a list of outdoor activities and a lot of these are traditional ones um, that again I'm not going to review. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, um, bubble activities because bubble activities typically, unless it's a child who's got some tactile issues, um, bubble activities are great activities to encourage movement with children who don't typically like to move. So being outside, blowing the bubbles, having the children chase the bubbles and pop the bubbles, that's a really, really nice activity um, for children to do that, that is, it can, can be motivating. Um, and um, the larger wand bubbles that I have there, that you know, the big ones that uh, you see that the child on the right um, using. Again, kids are encouraged to twirl. Remember, I love the whole body movement. So when they're using those bubble wands, they're twirling their bodies. They're seeing how the bubbles are, are moving. And it's a nice way um, to um, encourage gross motor activity. And the last one, so we've done okay with timing. Um, the last thing I'm going to show you is a nice um, gross motor activity that you might not think about that can be done inside or outside. A lot of kids with throwing and catching a ball, so about 70% of children and adults with an ASD diagnosis have motor planning problems. And that means they have problems planning and timing their actions. So throwing and catching a ball, practicing learning to throw and catching a ball um, can be very frustrating and not reinforcing. And often I tell people to start with batting at a balloon because they have more time, the, ball, the balloon floats, they have more time to get their body ready to hit it. And this is a lovely activity to do inside or outside. And you can use a, a balloon with a badminton racket or you can just make paddles, which, which you see on the right hand with, with um, paper plates. Um, and batting in a balloon. So again, for children who haven't been successful, some of your kids are avoiding gross motor activities because they haven't been successful in activities. They've gone to sport ball and they have difficulty uh, catching up, keeping up. They have difficulty in gym. They haven't had positive reinforcement in terms of their gross motor skills. The balloon um, batting really um, can provide them with some positive reinforcement. Um, and they might trial that when they might not try something else that requires more skills. So that's the last activity I'm going to show. Um, I hope you've um, learned some new things you can try at home for yourselves and your children. And uh, thanks for having me here for the hour. And I'm happy to answer any additional questions that you have. <clears throat> thanks so much, Ellen. That was uh, that was great. And uh, 
you know, a lot of interesting things there. Something I'm going to point out to the audience is we went through the list of activities. Those are in the PowerPoint slides that you're able to download, both in English and in French, and they all are all right there. We are nearing the end, uh, clearly. Um, and uh, I'm just going to show you the end in your handouts. I just wanted to show you in your handouts, you have those links uh, to different sites that provide a lot of uh, great um, gross motor activity suggestions. Um, and um, I've included also uh, a, a yoga site for some mindfulness as well, although that wasn't the topic. Um, uh, but you've, they're really nice uh, um, sites, particularly Go Noodle. Go Noodle is used in the schools, um, and they have lots of really fun gross motor activities, and they're motivating. They have lots of different characters. So for the kids, the younger kids, it is uh, better for younger children. But for children who have difficulty motivating, they have a lot of um, uh, videos that are highly motivating uh, for for children. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ellen. We got your email right there. And as everyone here knows, any questions that were not answered, you can reach out to Autism Ontario and they'll aspire to get those questions answered. We'll review the questions that did come in and get them back uh, to Ellen. Um, so that's the, all the time that we have today. A reminder, this webinar will be recorded on demand and you'll be able to get that on the Autism Ontario website, check out the past webinars or the Connecting With Us virtually section. I've also put that in the resources. And it's, um, it's something that you know we'd like you to share with other people that you know, um, friends, family, loved ones, those who are involved in the care of your, care of your children. The more people we get through this program, the more webinars we can put on. These things cost us money. And so if you're um, you know, sharing it broadly, this is helpful for everyone. I mean, I, as a parent, you know, I learned a lot. I got a bunch of new strategies and ideas that I want to implement this weekend uh, with my son. So, that, so it's, it's a good learning for everyone. Another thing that we've added here is, and I'm sure you're all aware of this, is how Autism Ontario um, is funded and, and how it is that, that it works. So um, basically, Autism Ontario uh, operates on grants and donations uh, from both individuals um, and companies. Um, and this is how we offer these webinars at no charge. And so, um, so we continue providing that support uh, and services for more than, I can't believe the number, 135,000 Ontarians in, in, in uh, uh, Ontarians with autism. Uh, we're starting to add a link to allow you or those that you know might be interested to, uh, to be able to donate to Autism Ontario. And you can see that in the handout section, which I popped up for you. I know we've gone a minute over. Ellen, this was a great presentation. Thanks so much for being here. And to all of you, we look forward to seeing you next time on our Autism Ontario webinars.